How do you get out of your comfort zone? How do you become more confident? Are you the shy and reclusive type? Are you the type of person that you go out in the street and you want to say hello to people, but you're too scared. You don't know how to start. You don't know how to start a conversation. Maybe you're a guy, you see a pretty girl. You don't know how to talk to her. If you're a girl, you don't know how to get into a bunch of conversations. Maybe you're in a coffee shop and you're working away at your computer and you see people come and sit next to you and you don't talk to them at all during the day and you just stick to yourself and you feel isolated and alone and nothing's happening and no one's inviting you anywhere. Does this feel like you? Well, it's time to get out of your comfort zone and become more confident. And today we're going to figure out how to do that. I have brought in a new friend of mine, a German fellow who lives here in Los Angeles by the name of Till Gross. He is the founder of Comfort Zone Crusher. So we're going to crush your comfort zone. He's got one of the top 100 TEDx talks of all time, which is called How to Become More Confident, Lay Down in the Street for 30 Seconds. And he helps young people overcome social anxiety with evidence-based psychology. Till Gross, how are you, mate? Great to have you here. I'm um, good. Thank you very much for having me. And uh, first of all, I think that was the best introduction I've ever had. So thanks for that. Well, thank you. I appreciate the kind words. This is about to be the best interview you've ever had as well. <laughs> there we go. <laughs> dealing with a master here. You're someone who's pushed himself out of his comfort zone and become a master interviewer. <laughs> very good, very good. I'm excited. So, so let's just get into this right away. You, were you a shy, reclusive type at one point and you learned how to beat the system or were you always confident? So I was never necessarily reclusive or shy. However, I did struggle with social anxiety to a certain extent, right? So I was always considered myself an extrovert. I love being around other people. I got a lot of energy from being around other people. But there were often certain situations where I would worry a lot what other people might think about me, right? I would go to certain parties only if I could bring my friends along because I was afraid of going there by myself. And then there might be like one situation, one moment where I stand by myself, no one is talking to me, and then other people might think I'm uncool. So those are pretty often those moments where I struggled and where I was a little bit afraid. And they were often, when I was 19, 20, I you know, did try to do things like you, where I tried to network and try to meet more people. There were often moments where I wanted to talk to a specific person at an event, but I didn't have the courage to walk up to them. And that was probably the biggest situations and moments where I struggled. So I would never really be shy or reclusive, but more there were specific things I would get like socially anxious and nervous and then didn't execute, didn't follow through on certain things. It's a common thing. I have a lot of people who follow my, my podcast, follow me on YouTube and my Snapchat, and they're always asking me, hey, how do I approach not just girls if they're a guy but like how do i approach even just you know, other guys in platonic situations and start a conversation i think we've always had that social anxiety um before why is it inherently in our brain like why are we wired to be afraid of actually putting ourselves into a new social environment it's a lot of different reasons right so one of the big reasons is um and so many people now at this point talked about this that if you go back tens of thousands of years, if you were in tribes back, back in the days, you would get rejected from one of the tribe members, probably the rest of the tribe would also reject you. And being excluded from the tribe most of the time would mean death. For this reason, we're terrified of rejection. Um, so even nowadays, we might get rejected by a person, it doesn't, have, it doesn't make, have any impact on our life because we just move on. Because for example, both of us, we live in Los Angeles. If you get rejected from one person, you just go over to the next bar, to the next club, to the next networking event, or maybe just to the next room, and there are a bunch of new people. Nobody cares that you got rejected five minutes before. However, it's still so deep inside of us that we're still afraid of rejection. Actually, there are a couple of studies that show um, they, they, put, um, they, they look at your brain, and there's certain um, parts of your brain that uh, light up when you feel pain. So when you feel physical pain, certain parts of your brain light, light up. Now, they uh, construct an experiment where people would get rejected. So you had like three people, two of them were playing a ball back and forth, and the person that was a, uh, the participant in the study, they would never pass the ball to this person. So the person would feel rejected, and then the same areas of the brain would light up that are associated with real physical pain. So getting rejected is also physically painful, and fear, at the end of the day, is nothing else than anticipated pain. So when I imagine, oh my God, there might be something painful in the future, my body shoots up adrenaline. I start to get fearful, anxious. So when you imagine a might get rejected, it might be painful. This is when fear comes into play and this reason why we're afraid of rejection. I love that. Fear is anticipated pain. 
Whoa, that's good. I like that. I mean, <laughs> not that there's anything to like about the actual meaning of it, but it's a, it's a cool, nice sentence, you know, fear is anticipated pain. So, okay. So the pain of what? Of rejection? Is that, is that what it is in, in a social context? It's the fear yeah. of rejection. So where's the danger in being rejected? Like what's the danger to us? And that's the thing, right? There is no real danger. So it's anticipated pain. So we, so we think at one point there might be the pain when I, for example, walk up to a, you know, an important person in a networking event, I walk up to them, I say something, it's not the right thing to say, and then they reject me. And we are afraid of this rejection. Our mind already projects we are getting rejected. And this is the thing that we fear. And for this reason, most of us never actually go ahead and talk to this person. So for this reason, we never find out that there's actually no pain waiting for us. Because usually, and this is what we do with our clients, basically it's exposure therapy. So you have to go out, you have to do face the things that scare you. And then you notice, I think uh, it was a Tim Ferriss interview where he talked to Jamie Foxx and Jamie Foxx uh, talked about this. He said, what is on the other side of fear? Nothing. And this is basically the case that Yes, it's anticipated pain, but once we put ourselves in those situations and once we approach other people, once we put ourselves in the situation where you might get rejected, it is not as painful as expected. So there's usually two outcomes. Either when I walk up to a person, I talk to them. Most of the time, they're friendly, they're nice, they talk back, and you have a good conversation. This might happen, and so you notice, wow, there's no pain actually happening. Or the other outcome might be, and everybody's already experienced this, you might walk up to a person, whether it's a guy or a girl, and you do get rejected. But then what you notice is, oh wow, like I got rejected, but I'm still alive. So nothing really happened to me. And then this is called desensitization. So after time, as you do this over and over and over again, the brain starts to learn, oh wow, I put myself in those seemingly dangerous situations again and again and again, where I might get rejected. And even though I do get rejected, nothing really happens to me. Nothing really physically happens to me. And there's actually no real danger waiting for me. And then step by step, you slowly start to lose your fear. You're never completely, but you lose it more and more. Yeah, I don't think anyone's ever going to overcome the fear oh, of yeah, rejection. Yeah. You just have to harness it and just use it. You, you, you kind of have to draw a line in the sand and just say, you know what? F it. I feel the fear, but I'm going to do it anyway. And then just do it anyway. And that's essentially what it is, right? And a lot of people think, uh, a lot of my clients, when they come to us at the beginning, we ask them, what do you want? And they say, I don't want to feel socially anxious anymore. I don't want to feel nervous anymore. And they're just so focused on not feeling the negative thing, thing anymore. And then we often shift the perspective and ask them, all right, let's imagine you wouldn't be anxious anymore. What would you do then? Would you just sit at home not being anxious or would you actually go out and do certain things? And they come up with things like, I would start going to parties. I would start dating. I would start, whether, you know, you know when, they, when, they, when they are an artist, they would go up on stage and present their art. And then we tell them, all right, we can't promise you that, we, that you will never feel fear again. However, we can get you to this level that you are able to talk to people, that you're able to date, that you're able to go up on stage and present your song or poetry or whatever it is, right? And I think this is the important thing. It's not not feeling fear anymore. It's being able to do all the things that you care about in your life because that's what it's really about. It's not about always feeling pleasant and comfortable. Instead, about creating meaning in your life. And meaning comes from doing the things that you value the most. All right, great. So let's do some practical ways here in which we can actually become more confident. Uh, let's do a handful of things. Um, first of all, bef actually, before we get into that, the, the, your TEDx talk, part of it is talking about laying down in the street for 30 seconds. Just yeah. explain that for us. So um, this, you know, the, the funny thing is this goes back. Uh, one of the things that we always pride ourselves on is that all of our stuff is backed up by a ton of science. So all of the people that work for me and and I myself as well, we all started psychology, we always go back to actually evidence-based studies. However, one of our core concepts did not come from evidence-based studies. Instead, it came from Tim Ferriss for our work with. Um, and he talked about, the, uh, about comfort challenges. And we call them comfort zone challenges. And one of the challenges that he proposed was to simply go to a crowded area, maybe a sidewalk, maybe a shopping mall, and simply lay down on the floor in the midst of all those people for 30 seconds. Um, and we started adapting that challenge, and that was the first challenge that I've ever done. Um, and the idea behind this is that the biggest fear most of the time we have is being rejected and being judged by others. Now, if and being what, sorry? Being rejected or being judged by others. Uh, being judged by others, okay. So, when you, and you know, exposure therapy and overcoming your fears is all about facing those fears. 
So when you consciously do something completely weird and crazy and nuts, where there's a high chance of other people looking at you, judging you, rejecting you, that's one of the best ways to overcome those fears by facing them head on. So when you lay down in the middle of a shopping mall on the sidewalk of the street, then what happens is probably you're very afraid that people might turn around, look at you and think you're crazy. And by doing this, usually two things happen. Either most people don't even turn around and don't even care what you do, especially in bigger cities in the States, or people actually do look at you and it kind of gives you weird looks. But then once again, you notice and you start to learn that nothing bad really happens. It might be a little bit uncomfortable, but at the end, you still survive it and nothing bad really happens. Yeah. Okay. I like that. So go to a crowded area and lay down on the floor in front of all, a whole lot of people and just do it for 30 seconds and exactly. maybe just rinse and repeat and do it a few times. Okay. So what's some other ways here we can crush our comfort zone and, and become more confident? Um, so one thing that we have is uh, we have a free seven day channel. So on our website, when people sign up there, um, they, they get over seven days, they get four different videos of uh, different comfort zone channels. So videos of me demonstrating different comfort zone challenges, how you can, you know, overcome your fears so you can get more comfortable talking to people um, and basically stop caring what other people think about you. But some of the favorite challenges that we have um, or that the people like the most, one of them is called hands to the sky. So simply what you do is you stretch your arms as high as you can. And then with your stretched arms in the air, you simply walk through a crowded area, you know, so sidewalk, shopping mall and so on. And then you simply, Look at the people that you pass straight in the eye while you have your arms straight in the air. And if this is too easy, to make it a little bit harder, what you can do is you can jump up and down while doing this and make noises like a bird and really attract a lot of attention. And after this, believe me, your heart is going to pump and it's going to go very fast. But afterwards, what people always say is it's kind of like give them this feeling of relief because once they did this and they attracted all this attention, but nothing bad happens, <sighs> afterwards they're kind of calm and completely relaxed. So jump up and down in front of a crowd and make sounds like a bird. Exactly. Okay, sh okay demonstrate for us right now. Till, go for <laughs> it. There are not too many people around. Otherwise, I would totally do this right now. No, oh, no, no. You're going to totally do it. Let's do also, it. I think, uh, I think you're the person who's standing right now, right? You, you are going to do it right now, <laughs> knowing that this is going to be listened to by thousands of people around the world and seen by thousands of people. So I want to see you act like a bird and make sounds like a bird right now. Let's see it. Come on, go. <laughs> Three, <laughs> two, one, go. <laughs> James, want you next time when we go for a hike, uh, we can shoot a little video together and then we can right, jump I'm going to do it now. <laughs> <laughs> How's that? That was very good. Is that good? <laughs> how, how many people were around? We've well, got, a couple I've of people, two listening, people right? <laughs> I've got two people in my living room right now and I've got you. So there's three. So was that the right thing to do? Just jump up and down in, in the street and just make sounds like that? That's it, yeah. You know that? Did you ever watch that movie Dumb and Dumber with Jim Carrey? And he goes, "Hey!" And 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 uh, the two of them, the two main characters, Jim Carrey's character and uh, what was the other actor's name? Damn it, I can't remember. But anyway, they're driving around, and they've got the killer, the bad guy, in there, and he's the the bad guy is sitting in between them. And Jim Carrey says to the bad guy, "Hey, do you want to hear the the most annoying sound in the world?" And he goes, "Ah, ah." <laughs> I'm just laughing hysterically. I'm just recalling this scene. It was so funny. <laughs> but like you could literally go out and just go up to like random people and go, hey, do you want to do you want to hear the world's most annoying sound? I think you just discovered a new comfort zone challenge. Oh man, that is funny. Oh, I'm just laughing at my own humor. Um, okay, so jump up and down and make sounds like a bird. All right, what's another one? Give us another give us another exercise. Um one of the challenges is, so at the end of the day, I would also want to mention is those confidence challenges are never about, you know, making fun of other people. It's more about like making fun of yourself and overcome your own insecurities, right? So another challenge is, is convincing strangers to do some crazy stuff with you. For example, what you try to do with me right now that you convince me, no, let's do the challenge, let's do the challenge. One of the challenges is that you should go out and you try to convince other people. For example, hey, let's do five push-ups together or let's uh, howl like a wolf together. Uh -huh. So this is another challenge where you, on the one hand, have to basically apply a little bit of social skills to convince another person and at the same time also, once again, make fun of yourself in public. Mm -hmm. All right. I like that. So just, just review that one more time for me, that last one. Just bottom line is. So you go out and you convince another person to do a comfort zone challenge together with yeah. you. 
I like it. So you, you basically got accountability, right? Yeah, it's, it's more like that you're able to convince another person to do something crazy with you. Yeah. And appro- approaching a stranger and, yeah. and getting a stranger, to, a stranger to do something crazy with you. Yeah. Yeah. I remember years, years ago, I was with someone and there was a pretty woman who walked by and we were, oh, wow, look at that woman. And um, the guy said to me, go, I'm going to talk to her. And I'm like, nah, nah, nah. I said, go, go, go. And I was like, oh, okay. And I got up and I just, and I just went. So having someone there to push you is huge. I mean, half the battle in life is having someone to hold you accountable in, in all areas, whether it's getting out of your comfort zone in, in terms of talking to someone or whether it's, you know, being held accountable for performing a work task, for example, or doing yeah. some, some kind of health activity. It's being held uh, accountable. All right, I like this. So, so far we've got go to a crowded area and lay down on the floor in front of people for 30 seconds. Second one is jump up and down and make sounds like a bird. Third one is convince another person to do it with you to dare someone. What else we got till? Um, what is another good one? Oh yeah. Uh, another good one is um, walk up to a stranger and tell them a joke and you can either make a quick short one or if you're very courageous, make it a very, very, very long joke and you make it not very funny. <laughs> a lot harder. see that's funny to me i just laughed out loud at the idea of that that's funny <laughs> there you go um i like that that's good uh in fact i know a friend of mine a guy called matt uh, matt gallard who lives down in panama city and he's an american guy he's an expat lives down there and he was telling me how he met his wife and he was sitting in a coffee shop an outdoor coffee shop and she walked by and she walked past him and he didn't do anything. And then he thought about it for about another five seconds. And he just finally said, F it. I'm just going to do it. And he got up and he ran after her and he stopped her. And he ended up marrying her. And they live, they live, you know, down in Panama. That's the story. City today. Yeah. It's, you hear these stories, you know. Now, if you're a guy listening to this, obviously, you know, there's a lot of uh, reward in being noble and, and then like, you know, being courageous. But... <laughs> I can tell you from firsthand experience, it also can backfire on, on you. So I don't want to create even more fear, but like I've, I've done something similar where I thought I was being the romantic guy and, and kind of like, you know, these grand gestures, but it just wasn't the, the attention. Oh, wasn't was ah, there was a woman in damn Colombia, and I would write her letters in perfect Spanish and I'd fly down to see her and I'd give her flowers and do all these kind of <laughs> things. And she was having none of it. <laughs> I, I don't, this, this is this is none of our comfort zone challenges. Um, there's no comfort zone challenge where you have to write letters in Spanish. So, <laughs> well, that was definitely getting me out of my comfort zone. I but, actually, but, but you know, like, like you know, let, let, let's stay with this for a second, right? Mm. Um, that you know, this might happen. Like, this is also one thing that a lot of people should realize that once you put yourself out there, and once you take a social risk, you know, whether it's something loud, stupid, like jumping up on the street, or something series like you did where you really care about another person and you do grand gesture for example and it's not um not recipro- uh how, what is this word reciprocated exactly that's 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 the word that i was looking for it hurts right and it's painful and it's uncomfortable at least i assume it was hurtful and painful and uncomfortable but yes not- but it gave me a lot of great content for my podcast for many years <laughs> there you go, there you go. and and this might always happen and i think one big part is um this is the same thing. This is courage, right? Courage means not playing it safe. It means that you actually, so the scientific definition of courage is uh, the willingness to face risk, fear, and uncertainty, mm. right? So as soon as it's safe and you definitely know you're going to get a certain outcome or there's no danger, then this is not courage. Then you just do something within your comfort zone. And most yeah. of the time, any grand gestures often take exactly this courage. And with small stuff like comfort zone challenges, funny as it sounds, you can practice this process of facing fear, facing risk, facing uncertainty. Um, it doesn't prevent you or doesn't protect you from getting hurt at one point, but it gets you, it makes you better at the process of facing these things. Okay. All right. I like that. Now, um, when it comes to facing fear and uncertainty, there was a time when I became a sports center anchor on ESPN. And I remember I was, I went for my audition at ESPN in 2010 and I was so uncertain. I had so much fear, not just of failing, but of succeeding. And it was the uncertainty of what my life might be if I succeeded. And I remember I went down and I did this audition in a suit and tie in front of the, the, the ta- uh, in front of the director and the producer and the camera. And I had a panic attack 
And I mean, it's a, it's a real thing. Like where you just like, Oh, you clamp up. And my first audition was terrible. It was like, hello, welcome to sports center. I'm James Swanick. It was really bad. And the producer looked at the video and he said, yeah, it's no good. Thanks for auditioning. But, but you know, thanks. Thanks again. And I, in that moment I had a choice. It was like, okay, I can either say, all right, I messed that up and walk away or I could ask for another shot. So I decided to ask for another shot. I had nothing to lose, right? So I said, listen, can I come back again tomorrow and give it another go? And he respected me for asking and he said, okay, come back tomorrow. So the next day I went back and uh, I still was fearful, but, I, but, but I, I managed to pull myself together and I went, good evening, everyone. Welcome to Sports Center. James Swanick here alongside Anthony Howard. Here to take you into the weekend with a smorgasbord of sports. Let's start with the NFL. And it was really good. I mean, it was a hundred times better than the day before. And uh, I ended up getting the gig. I ended up getting a job hosting Sports Center on ESPN. If you if you Google James Swanick, how I bluffed ESPN, you can read the blog post and you can see a video of me making my or my uh, my debut on Sports Center. And you can see some behind the scenes photos of me when I did the audition and when I was shaving my beard off before I, before I went on on camera. So th- there is a that's what I mean by you're always going to feel the fear. And sometimes it's not necessarily a fear of failure. Sometimes it's a fear of succeeding because it's like, if you succeed, it's like, Whoa, my whole identity is just going to be lost. I'm going to be this yeah. person. Yeah. Once again, you know, this, this is uncertainty, right? And there's certainly there's even if that uncertainty, there's a potential that this uncertainty feels great. There's still uncertainty. Uncertainty. Once again, there might always danger hiding somewhere. And I, and I love something about the story that you just mentioned, because often when I talk about, when I give workshops and I talk about exposure therapy and I say, all right, if you're afraid of something, what you have to do is put yourself out there, do this thing again and again and again and again. And either two, one or two things happen, either it goes great, awesome, or it doesn't go this great, but you notice nothing bad happened. And then there's always at least one person in the room's room that raises their hand and says something along the lines of what you just said. Well, I faced my fear, for example, you were doing the audition, and it was terrible, I had a panic attack, it went horrible, or maybe I told a woman that I love her and she rejected me, and it was horrible, it was the worst thing that I've ever done. And this is exactly the problem. And then people think, oh, I shouldn't face my fears, but this is exactly the problem. You haven't faced your fears often enough. So even if it goes terribly wrong at one point, if you keep on going, it will always pay off in the long run, right? So for example, yes, with this one lady, maybe the grand gesture didn't work, but if she would stop there and give up there, probably the pain of being lonely for the rest of your life is worse than keep on going. Maybe you get rejected one more time or another time or, but probably most likely at the end, you will get married. For example, you will find a girlfriend or whatever your goal is in this context. Right. And the same with you at this, at this uh, of the audition, right? The first time, yes, went terribly wrong. You had a panic attack, but the next time it worked out. Mm-hmm. So this is also the big thing. Even if it goes wrong once or twice, as cheesy as it sounds, sounds like a platitude, right? but keep on going, it's gonna get better. Like, this is the thing. If there's no real danger waiting for you, so there's no real physical harm that's waiting for you, it will get better. And this is the hardest part. Keep pushing through this fear and uncertainty towards, at one point, it being better. Yeah, it's, it's funny, you know, like are you, uh, people use this analogy all the time, but it's such a good analogy. It's like in baseball, if you go up to bat, and you are batting four, like 350, which means every time you go out, like three and a half times out of 10, you make it to first base. You're considered one of the greatest baseball uh, uh, batters of all time. Like you're, a, you're an exceptional player in the professional leagues getting paid millions of dollars if you fail six and a half times every time you go out to bat. Mm-hmm. Isn't that incredible? Like you, like you get rewarded with millions of dollars if you fail more than you succeed. Yeah. That's the I'm, extraordinary thing. Yeah, I'm always so skeptical, uh, so uh, repulsed, so re- uh, rejective. I'm always, I most of the time with those platitudes like, you know, Michael mm-hmm. Jordan, he missed 16% of all his shots, right? However, you know, even though it's a platitude and everybody talks about this, I think there's still some truth underneath it, right? Um, and I think it's right. Most of the time, also if you look at most successful people yes you do fail most of the time and then all you need to do is hit a home run once and then you start forever basically right well in, in entrepreneurship you, you can be wrong 10 times and then your 11th business makes a billion dollars and you're just a hero for forever you're a legend it's like yeah you, know, you only have to be right once in order to like 
<laughs> and, but then, then you also notice that being red once, making a billion dollars and being a super success will never make you happy. <laughs> well, that's true. I mean, I've done, I did a podcast episode a few weeks ago on does money buy happiness. And I made the point that in, in, my, in my area uh, currently, I'm doing very well in a business that I started with my youngest brother. And it gives me immense joy because I started it with him and because I came up with the idea and because it, it helps so many people. And it gives me so much pleasure. And the fact that we hit a huge financial milestone recently with the business um, actually made me very, very happy. So I actually would argue that money does, does give you happiness depending on how you make the money or depending on how the money came into your life. So um, it's not that money buys happiness or money equals happiness. It's for me, it's how did you make that money? Like what did you do? Yeah. Who did you become? Who did you help in order, in order to make that? It's so, you, you cannot just say, Oh, that guy's got $20 million, but he's, he, he's probably not happy. No. I mean, maybe he's like super happy because he's, helped a hundred thousand people and he's given to charity and he's, he's free to do whatever he wants and whatever he wants. And maybe money does buy happiness. It's just the way that he got there. The way that he, he yeah. produced it, I should say. Yeah. Oh, good. I like this. You're coming back at me. You're not, you're not agreeing with it. Good. Argue with me. Do it. Let's go. So, so, um, so, so, so most of the time accomplishments are, it's like, it's a, it's a single individual moment, right? And, and the chances of this individual moment that happens, you hit the milestone. It's like a, it's like a one time event, right? You don't hit the same milestone every single day again, right? You don't live Groundhog Day. It's like this one thing and then you move on. Then the next thing happens, right? So probably consistent last. So this, in this moment we hit the milestone, I completely understand. Yes, this makes you happy in this moment and probably for the next week or two weeks or three weeks. However, after some time, it vanishes off. And this comes in called uh, hedonic adaptation. So after some time, a thing that makes you happy right now, after some, some time, you drop back to the status quo of your happiness. Right. And a bunch of studies, and the most famous study that no bunch of people know the studies nowadays, is where you take two people, on the one person, on the one hand, you have people who um, get like a million dollars in the lottery, and the other person is someone who's like, um, uh, paralyzed paraplegic right? yeah and exactly, with, exactly. And after six months their the, the, their happiness level is or is has resorted back to what it was before they actually got the million dollars or they had the exactly yeah. so that's like the, that's that's like the evidence behind this for probably accomplishment will never make you happy however and that's what you just said right the struggle towards the accomplishment there's like this day-to-day -day struggle that you consciously chose that's what makes you happy. And I think in life, it's not so much necessarily about happiness, but more about meaning. This is what really creates life satisfaction. And probably for life satisfaction, meaning is way, way bigger and more important uh, than just like pleasure and happiness. So for this reason, choosing is, and no matter what you do, whether you're a business owner or you're an employee, there are, is a certain struggle behind this. There's a certain pain behind this. And I think the thing that decides if you're gonna be a happy person or not is if you figure out what is the struggle that you want to embrace, and the pain that, that you want to accept that comes with a certain path that you chose because it gives meaning to your life. And for example, in your case, working with your brother, doing a specific business, being an entrepreneur, that is, I know for sure it's not easy, but this is the pain that you chose to accept and this, this is the pain that gives meaning to your life. That's at least how I see it. And this is the reason why uh, I believe that accomplishments not what make, will make you happy, but the struggle towards uh, the accomplishment. It's, uh, here it is. Progress equals happiness. Yeah. Progress equals happiness. So if you, as, for me, I know this definitively, as long as I'm progressing in, in, in all areas of my life, finances, health, relationships, education, um, all, all areas, I know that I'm, I'm generally speaking very happy. And that's the key. As long as you are progressing, as long as you feel like you are progressing, Progress equal, equals, equals happiness. So it's not necessarily a one-time accomplishment because you are right. As soon as you achieve, a, comp a lot of people, as soon as they achieve accomplishment, they get that win. It's also a loss because now they've got to find the next thing. There you go. And they jump on the hedonic treadmill and it's like, okay, cool. Now I'll go and get this thing and now I got it. And then it, it, it lasts for a little bit of time and then it, it goes back again. So that's why progress in all areas of your life and how you understand pro what your thought process around progress is will, will equal happiness. I love how we started off with how to get out of your comfort zone and now we're, 
we're having philosophical conversations about happiness. Um, go you know, to a- that, 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 that's just just wrap this up, right? Because that's what it all boils, boils down to. Like yes. even getting out of your comfort zone. If you only ask people why do you want to go out of your comfort zone, and if you break it down several layers, most of the time they just want to be satisfied with their life and themselves. That's all it is. We're talking to Till Gross, who's the founder of Comfort Zone Crusher. You should check out his TEDx talk. It's called How to Become More Confident. Lay down in the street for 30 seconds. Uh, is, there one, is there one time that you recall, Till, where you were like so scared, so nervous, so fearful, and you just pushed through and you just did it anyway? And what was the result when that happened? Um, so probably my, my very, very first Comfort Zone challenge, that was definitely a moment was very, very scared. Um, Probably another thing was, um, I was uh, 20, 20, yeah, I was 20. Um, and I was still going to university. I was still my second semester in school, was back in Austria and Vienna. And I, for, I have no idea why I set myself this goal, but I told myself with very, very large classes, with like 600, 700 people per class, and I told myself, I want to hold a lecture here in front of all those people. I want to do it this year. And um, it was very unrealistic. And I talked to all my different professors. Everybody said, no, this is not possible. You can't do this. And then I walked up to my favorite professor, a uh, neuroscience professor. I liked him a lot. I think he was an incredible teacher. And I told him, I asked him, I was like, hey, if I relentlessly prepare like a tiny, tiny part of the book and I just like work my butt off and I know this tiny section of the book better than you, do you think in the, in the case you were sick, am I going to get the chance for 15 minutes, hold part of the lecture? And he started smiling. He was like, hey, you know what? And he kind of knew that I was doing some stuff on the side. He was like, you know what? I really like the way you approach your studies. How about you just give a talk at the introduction of the summer semester to all those students and you just talk about how you approach your studies and how you approach uh, basically learning and your own career. And I was like, all right, I'm happy to do this. Um, and that was a moment, that was probably one of the scariest things I've done at this point of time because I would walk in there and everybody was, significantly older than me everybody at this class was a couple semesters ahead and i would walk in there stand in front of 700 students that were my age or older and i would tell them basically and share with them how they could approach their studies and how they could approach their career and i was terrified because i thought i walk in there and i could really picture it people might really think okay who is this young kid what the fuck is he talking about who the fuck he thinks he is Nobody signed up to listen to me. They came to listen to my professor. And what is this kid doing in front of us? And I did it anyways. Um, and I was terrified weeks before and couldn't, couldn't sleep. But it was so important to me. So I wanted to do it. And I did it. And a couple of people right at the beginning didn't even listen to me, just walked out of the room. Um, but 95% of the people stayed. Um, and they applauded. And it was a pretty good success. My professor was very proud of me. The people liked it a lot. Um, and this actually then later on, led to my second TEDx talk because someone who organized a TEDx event watched the video of this, watched the recording of this, um, and then invited me, asked me, hey, can you do this in English? Uh, can you give a TEDx talk about this? And then I gave my second TEDx talk. Um, that was one moment where I definitely, felt, and I'm still thinking back about this right now, I still remember the sleepless nights right before. Yeah. It's amazing. If you just step up to the plate, you feel the fear and you do it anyway, amazing things can happen. Remember, fear is simply anticipated pain. And on the other side of fear is nothing. You like that one, huh? I love it. <laughs> I love it. I'm going to roll with it. Till Gross, founder of Comfort Zone Crusher. Thank you so much. Uh, to the listener and the viewer, make sure you go to comfortzonecrusher.com. Comfortzonecrusher.com. Check out Till's uh, TEDx talk how to become more confident, lay down in the street for 30 seconds. Uh, just to review those challenges, number one, go to a crowded area, lay down on the floor in front of all these, in front of a bunch of people for 30 seconds. Number two, jump up and down and make sounds like a bird, like I demonstrated for you here. Uh, number three, convince someone else to do it. Accountability, dare someone and have them dare you. Uh, and then number four, walk up to a stranger and just tell them a very bad or a very long joke and just see what happens. Uh, but be willing to face fear and uncertainty. Just push through, feel the fear, and just do it anyway. Till, thanks very much for your time. I really appreciate it, buddy. Thanks a lot, James.